Hello, everybody out there in YouTube land. This is your t-shirt historian. And welcome to another week in geek. All right. Well, this is spooky month. And uh, I had hoped to have uh, Mark Reinhagen on today. However, it looks like he's had a bit of an emergency. So I am deeply sorry, guys. I didn't mean to... Uh, Get everybody's hopes and hypes up but uh we're still trying hopefully you know he'll pop in a little bit later if not then hey i i apologize um life happens you know it's like the old saying goes you know the surest way to hear god laugh is to uh, announce your plans so <laughs> amen so anyway i do have a guest i don't know where the hell my other panelists are and Grim said he was coming. Um, Victor was bowing out for today. Uh, Ironcaster's busy. Oh my! Harmony is busy. Um, yeah, I got a. I got like twenty-one people, twenty-two people in my uh, in my list, and and I can't get any panelists today. And that there's something, you know. I don't know. Maybe I need to reconsider. But uh, anyway. This is just like a like the day of serendipitous defeat, I think. Anyway, I do have a guest on. Uh, this is Mr. Jason. Hello, T-shirt. How are you? Well, I guess I could be doing better, but yeah. uh, you know, I'm, I'm flying solo. Looks like. Well, <laughs> for now, you know, I get we, easier uh, easier to do one on one conversation. Have some fun with this. So we, uh, yeah. That's okay. As you said, yeah. it's all it, it's it's spooky month. It's what a great time to talk about spooky role playing games. Indeed, indeed. Um, and as we were going to have Mark on, and for mm -hmm. those that don't know, I, I work with Mark Reinhagen. Um, how long have you been playing Vampire the Masquerade? Since ninety two. Yeah, same, same. Oh, there's Grim. We do have a Hello. Grim. Hey, man. Yes. I'm so yes, glad you joined us. Grim, how long have you been playing Vampire the Masquerade? Since the day it came out in the UK. And due to a coincidence. And I was certainly playing it when there was only the one book. I don't know that I played it the yeah. day it came out, but I've been playing it since since the beginning. Had a Dark Ages game that ran back in southern Illinois for seven years every week. Um Man, those were some big characters when we had to knock off those. Those were I. You, you got to be careful if if a game gets really longer than you anticipated. If you're not careful, they can scale out of control. One of the things I like about the White Wolf games is I don't feel they do that. Um, even after seven years, I felt you know these are big characters, but they're not unwieldy. They're not too big, and I've certainly played some games where. You just can't afford to make them too big too quick without without the game just being ruined. White Wolf feels more balanced. Yeah, the ascending costs of things, I think, helps a lot. I agree. I agree. A t-shirt, yeah. I, I just took over and just started asking questions in a tour show. I'm sorry. That's <laughs> all right. That's all right. It's, it's not, you're not the first time I've had a uh, guest come over and just kind of take over for me. Um, it happens. But uh, anyway, yeah, uh, we we had a lot of uh, panelists lined up who were, you know, wanted to come in and hang out and talk to Mark. And it's like, you know, they started kind of dropping off one by one. And I had uh, other guys who were kind of like, well, I've never played Vampire, so I wouldn't know what to ask. And I'm just kind of yeah. like, he does, he does other stuff. But Ars, Ars Magica and, and uh, he had the, the uh, was it I Am Zombie? Was that? Yeah. I think yeah. that was, and, yeah. yeah, and then Lost Lorne now. Yeah, I was going to ask, yeah, what, what happened with Lost Lorne? Because, you know, the Kickstarter, you know, we, I backed it, and it was successful, and then it was just kind of like, bloop. Well, there were a few things, and this is where I was hoping to coordinate with Mark just, just to make sure that I, I was given permission to say what I did. But he's not here, so I'm going to say what I will. Um, <laughs> the One of the important things, of course, is feedback, and... and uh, Mark, while the Kickstarter was going on, we were still giving it to some people for some reviews. And we had a few people that said, eh, you've got a few issues, layouts, and a few other things. Um, 
frankly, we had, we had a few people that said it wouldn't, wouldn't hurt to pull it back and do a little bit more editing on it. Um, your, your presentation could, could use a little bit of work. So we did. Um, uh, it, as you said, it was successfully funded. Um, but we kind of said we'd rather it to be successfully funded and everybody rant and rave about it than for, for it to successfully fund and people say, uh, it's a bit of a first draft. Some game companies do that. Um, I'm, mm. I'm in awe that there are, some com- there are some games I've bought and they ship it to you and then they're like, yeah, and in a year we'll clean it up. You're getting the rough draft. Let us know what mistakes you find. And I kind of get frustrated at that. Um, I not They're not paying me. enough. In fact, I'm having to pay. <laughs> Um, so that was one of the things that we looked at that and said, we didn't, we didn't want that to be our reputation. So we pulled it for that. Um, the state of lost learn right now, um, we have, so the Badlander book is done. The Valazar book is done. Uh, Badlander is in layouts. Valazar is in final edits. Mark's been through it. Um, and I've been through it and now I'm going through it again, incorporating Mark's edits. Um, we have a, Valazar is a city. We have a continent called Vestur. Uh, it is, I think it's written. Uh, if not, it's it's just weeks away from being written. Um, I think the Fang Knight, the vampire book, I think it's written. Um, and then our fifth book, Crestfallen, is eh, probably about a third done. So in various stages, we've got five books, and I would say two of them are, are done, except for edits and layouts. And the other two are very, very close to done. Um and so where are we at? Uh, the go- Probably, I cr- Kickstarters don't always do too well around Christmas time. Um, mm. People are saving up their money for Christmas presents and travels. Um, so multiple times, Mark has said, remember, in you know, January, we're going to hit the ground running. So that's still the plan. As far as I know, the plan is still, let's hit the ground running. In a perfect world, we can do more than one Kickstarter a year. And certainly with more than one book, written, edited, laid out, I would hope that we can do that and, and hit the ground with a couple of books next year. Um, uh, yeah, it's just it's just kind of a layout thing with presentation, which is such a big deal. And that's one of the things that I didn't take into account. Um, people really people really care about layouts. It, 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 the layouts oh, yeah. are the under, nobody, nobody talks about it till it's bad and then it's horrible. Um, the one game that a lot of people rant and rave about how good it is, for example, is old school essentials. It's very simple, but it's very readable, very clean. Um, I like, and, and you don't have to turn the page to finish a section. They did a very good job laying it out that an entire section is complete on spread. You turn the page on a new section and everybody appreciates that. We don't talk about it, but boy, it's readable. Um, mm-hmm. Blades in the Dark and some of its spinoffs like Scum and Villainy are very similar. Um, it's so easy to read. I can put a bookmark in Blades in the Dark and, uh, you know, if I only read two pages, advance the bookmark and I'm not mid-paragraph. You almost never turn the page to finish a paragraph. So that's one of the things we're kind of discovering. Some of the feedback that we've got is it's it's okay, but, improve, you know, the writing is good, the, the art is amazing, but your layouts, it could be a little clearer. So that's what we're working on right now is, is presentation. Hmm. That's good. Yeah. Um, we've been talking to a lot of creators over the past um, few weeks, and we're, we're talking to another one this next week. And one of the things we have been looking out at, looking at is different layouts that uh, a lot of these guys are, are putting out. And some of them have been a little, you know, controversial, but uh <laughs> The industry is getting really hard to anticipate. Um, Morkborg is really hard to read. But, oh, yeah. but on the other hand, it's a very popular game. And I think they get away with it because there's not a lot of text. It's a very short game at the end of the day. Um, but it, and they, but it's very, they do it's reiterate very it at the end. So Yeah. Um, but, it, but it's still a very difficult read. Uh, it takes longer to read 200 words in Morkborg than it does most other books. Um, and, and so that one, I don't know if it, if it, if part of its success is because of its like weird layouts, but I don't know that anybody else could copy that and get away with it very easily. Um, I, I kind of view, uh, Morkborg as the Devo of, um, (laughs) role-playing games because, you know, Devo did not start out 
wanting to be a band. They want they started out wanting to be like a, an art project. I and, I and I've heard that said about Morkborg that in many ways it's more of an art project about a role playing game. Yeah, than it is a role playing game. Um, yeah, I it's it's a tough. It's tough to look at, and I don't know that I would want an entire series of books like that. For a single quirky standalone book, it's probably fine. Um, but if the whole industry went to that, we'd we'd all have migraines. Yeah, mm. I think it, I think it's fine for very simple games where the book itself is the experience. I it's, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, it, it's the kind of the extreme end of making the book fit the world and 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 draw you into it. Um, so yeah, it's at the opposite end of usability, but it it does draw you into the game and set the tone and everything. And one of the things, and I've got a buddy that I went to college with named Daniel that is uh, friends at least with, with T-shirt with you and I on on uh, Twitter. Um, Daniel frequently says, and I and it's a very wise, simple statement: the system is part of the setting. Um, and and we see Morkborg is a good example. It's kind of crazy but the whole setting is kind of crazy and the system you couldn't do the Morkborg setting with say the cthulhu system or the chaosium system or or 5e it wouldn't be the same experience this the setting makes sorry the system helps make the setting um and when a game does that i think it's very successful so for Morkborg, i think the setting is why kind of the deconstructed layout, the layout itself feels post-apocalyptic. Um, and so it works, but I don't know that you could do that. For example, if you're not telling that kind of a post-apocalyptic setting, I don't know that that kind of post-apocalyptic layout would therefore work. There are more of these kind of boutique products showing up that are primarily coffee table books or yep collector's items um i think nobly was probably the first one that was a coffee table book well i think that was their second or, or third edition that's the big square you know mm. heavy printing one um we've had kingdom death in board games is very much a boutique product and now we've had i guess morkborg cyborg yeah um and a few others have popped up on kickstarters and things that the primary purpose doesn't seem to be the playing of the game necessarily. It's it's the object. Well, in Kingdom Death's case, I actually own that game. Um, and yeah, the artwork is insane, but it's beautiful. And of course, it's very easy to just point out and say, oh, well, it's, you know, just a game that's just kind of based around the miniatures. And I'm like, well, yes, it is. But there is an actual playable game to it that is actually a lot of fun and very challenging and very difficult and they they have stuck to it and they've they've kept updating it and making it better and better and better it's still just gruelingly expensive to mm. keep up with but it's you know it very much fits a certain niche for people i mean people who enjoy body horror uh you know really dark anime like berserk or um just the whole the whole concept of the play is the thing more so than how it ends because just, I mean, spoiler alert, every single ending of every single campaign in kingdom death monster results in death. It doesn't matter how successful your settlement is. It doesn't matter what kind of advancements you have. Every single ending is your settlement, your characters all die hmm. there's this is just unavoidable and then that is the kind of the fatalistic nature of the game but the and experience is all of the stuff that you did along the way i mean did, what did your tribe do what did, what stuff did you collect what mysteries did you unlock about the game what monsters did you kill and that makes it special so it's kind of like real life none of us are getting out of this alive uh what matters <laughs> is the experience along the way yeah exactly um and i like that because you know a lot of my friends do not enjoy that idea they, they think that's a horrible thing they're they kind of like the typical storybook ending where you know everything is okay but that is, that's to me seems like a very japanese kind of an ending where it's not 
the ending that matters. It's the journey along the way. It's, it's all the experiences that you shared and all the, the joys and the, the pain and everything else that you went through to get there. Um, I, there's and, obviously room for both, both kinds of games. Yeah. And yeah. maybe we're better for playing both kinds of games. Yeah. Uh, and I would also liken uh, cyberpunk to being that way very much. Uh, that's one of the things I like about that. Yeah. And most, I don't, I don't think most cyberpunk campaigns actually ever end. I think most people just get tired and quit. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. Jim has more experience with it than I do. Um, but uh, from what I've seen from, you know, cyberpunk edge runners from 2077, um, the ending of the characters and stuff like that usually isn't good. So, you know, mm. it's just, it's kind of like all the stuff that you did along the way, all the experiences that you had along the way playing the game. Cause eventually, you know, you're, you're going to die in night city. It's, you know, it's a city that chews you up and spits you out. By by its nature, cyberpunk is dystopian. It yeah. probably shouldn't have, shouldn't lean on happy endings because that just goes against the entire concept of the genre. It becomes something different. It's not cyberpunk if it has a happy ending. Um, you can have a futuristic setting. Star Trek has a happy ending, um, by and large. Um, but But the cyberpunk genre being dystopian should be pretty discouraging. The victories... The victories are you. You want your victories, but they're smaller. They have they. They're not broad sweeping, uh, and you know that they're temporary. Um, yeah, Judge Judge Dredd being a, probably one of the best examples of you know. You, oh, yeah. you, he's a jerk. You root for him. He wins sometimes, um, but there's always more problems later. Right. Um, well, that's kind of like the you know the Punisher books that I read too. Is like it doesn't matter how many criminals he kills. There's always more of them. So. Right. But um, but it's it's funny. Okay, y'all out there in the chat, get your drinks ready. Um, yep, yep. It's time. I I have to ask this question. I have to say this. Uh, so I I spoke to Kevin Crawford recently. Um, yep. who is like one of my favorite game designers, and I own all yep. his books. And uh, I asked him about it. I you know I had I just recently backed Cities Without Number, and it's one of my new favorite games from him. Yeah. And I asked him, I said, uh, I noticed that there's no heroic rules for Cities Without Number. I said, there's heroic rules in Stars Without Number and, and Worlds Without Number and all the other games that you have, but not for Cities Without Number. And he pretty much point blank told me, he said, well, the the genre doesn't really seem to favor uh, heroic role play. Mm. He said, it's, it's pretty dark and, you know, people die and that's just kind of the way things go. So it there really are no heroes in a cyberpunk style game. Oh, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, the heroes are there in edge runners. It's just, you know, they pay a big cost, right? Mm -hmm. And in ghost in the shell, that unit, they're heroes. The, the world is a horrible world, but you know, they act heroically and they pull off things that no one else would battle angel Lolita. She's basically super heroic in a dystopian, cyberpunk world so well, i think okay. it's just it's it's just that you can't ever win that's <laughs> i think it's it's the important part i i enjoyed uh, uh i certainly enjoyed the movie minority report um no nah, it had differences from the book but i i enjoyed minority report i thought tom cruise did well it's he he played a good heroic character in under no i mean he didn't fix the world all he did was save himself um and maybe <laughs> only for the short term um, to me, that's a good cyberpunkish hero. Um, eh, you, you live to fight another day. Eventually you'll lose, but you live for now. Again, very real life to me. I think I, I certainly feel like we're living in a dystopian these days. Definitely. Um, only this is not the really cool dystopia with, you know, like the robots and the cybernetics and the flying cars and right. you know, the, well, the cool neon and everybody wearing fetish clothing. Unless you live like in Abu Dhabi. I think they've got the flying car. I think they've got the flying bikes i've seen yeah but they also they also have the keeping you held hostage in the country if you well there may be the yeah. noise details <laughs> details Come on. Come on. that's part of that's that's the you have to have that if the you're going to be in dystopian you have to be a prisoner <laughs> and it's only the cops that have the flying bikes i think but i guess so <laughs> but i don't know yeah i'll tell you what uh 
I used to. So I think, am I allowed? Am I allowed to say? Too late. I've already started. Right. So by profession, um, I am a Christian pastor, um, and I'm full confession. When people used to say, "Oh, Jason, don't you see? You read the Bible. These are the end times." I just kind of nod and uh -huh and kind of go back and just kind of laugh. Uh, people for 2000 years have been saying these are the end times. I'll tell you what, March 2020, there's that part of me that says, uh, I don't know, <laughs> this feel this. I, and so I've started, <laughs> I've started collecting all the dystopian books, all the ones that I didn't have. Make sure that sitting on the shelf, Brave New World, uh, uh, Fahrenheit 451, Clockwork Orange, get them all on the shelf because they're starting to get a little bit more predictive. Mm -hmm. Than, than they ever were. And I agree, therefore, with what you just said. Um, we've we've made a game out of dystopia with Cyberpunk and Shadowrun and these other games. But the truth is that I don't want to live in Fahrenheit 451. I don't want to live in, in Clockwork Orange. I don't want to live in Brave New World. The the true dystopians that 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 I feel like we're kind of moving into, um, I don't think I want to live here. It's not nearly as fun, which is probably why people gain to escape and want those happy endings. Um, but I'm not sure that creating a fantasy ending uh, does a good job. I, I think one of the neat things about gaming is that it, that it, that it can kind of help you process through some stuff. You know, yes, it's an escape. Yes, it should be fun. Um, but while we're having fun, we can work through some, some stuff. And that's one of the things I like about gaming. And... That's one of the things, therefore, I like about dystopian fiction and like about dystopian games um, is we can walk away and say, now, what lesson did we learn? And I think that that's, <laughs> I think that that's a good thing. Uh, and if we only give ourselves happy endings, um, well, I don't real life doesn't work that way. Mm -mm. No, um, I still I think, think it's kind of ironically funny, but um, you remember the uh, the Matrix, right? Oh, heavens. Great, great dystopian. Yeah. yeah, great. But I mean, there's there's this point I want you know where uh, you know Agent Smith is is talking to Neo, and he's he's like he's like we originally the first you know the first Matrix was you know a a fantasy that everybody could you know live and enjoy, and and there was no pain and harm or anything else. And he says, and we lost entire crops because your minds couldn't accept this. Hmm. I yeah. always laugh about that, but. Um, I almost kind of wonder if uh, we're starting to see a generation that is going to be able to accept it. I don't know. Are, are we slowly being conditioned to accept the matrix? I, uh, we are losing, boy, this could get dark. We, it could. I do, I do think we are losing the ability to critically think college is, you know, you go, you go back to the time of the enlightenment when they were really universities were taking off. The first thing that they taught was what they called the trivium which was grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric. Uh, and that was before you learned the quadrivium, which was music and astronomy and math. And I don't remember what the fourth one was. Um, but the concept behind the trivium was you have to learn how to learn. You have to learn how to process and then make your own conclusion and then be able to communicate it effectively uh, with other people. And once you learn how to do that, then we can start teaching you other subjects. Um, and we've lost the ability to process, to to evaluate, um, to express ourselves. And so I think we're becoming increasingly a caste with an E society because the haves and the have nots, the difference is those who can take command of their own destinies and those who are, um, we, we use the word NPCs, right? Mm. Uh, <laughs> and I think that that is the direct, I, that, that's my fear. We need, to, we, we take the easy way out. And we need we need to we need to learn to think for ourselves, break out from that, not you know, not go with what's easy or go with the crowd, um, but go with what we think is right. Uh, go with what we think. You know, I'm not saying we all need the same morality or ethics, or, or certainly even the same religion. I'll I'll be the first to say that, um, but we do need to think for ourselves. And and if something is right, then then stick with it, even if you're even if you stand alone. I was going to say um, earlier. I think you don't need the the fantasy of the of the happy ending. I, I I think it's enough to have the fantasy of effective agency in the world that you can command mm. your own destiny, that you're not completely helpless to the whims of the world going on around you, which I think a lot of people feel these days. 
that was what made me fall in love with the first role playing game I ever played. I mean, D and D when I was in kindergarten or first grade or something, and I can do anything. Nobody's going to stop me. My my halfling can go this way or this way. Or what if I want to turn around and go backwards? What what if I don't want to go anywhere? And my cousin, the GM, saying, "Yeah, you can do whatever you want to. Anything, anything." You know, with, within the reason of what your character is physically capable of doing. And that just boggled my mind because that's what make that's what board games don't let you do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was when I fell in love with, that was why I fell in love with role-playing games was there was infinite choice. And I think you're right, Jim. Um, I think in real life, a lot of us feel very boxed into a corner. Finances and politics and wars, and we feel like we don't have a lot of choices. Oh yeah, I definitely agree. Um, and I, you know, I I agree that our role playing games should be an escape. They should be a way to kind of transcend and and we'll be able to walk away from the things that we have to deal with on an everyday basis. And yet, there's this entire subculture of um, new players who all want to want their fantasy games to mirror reality. You know, as we we joke about it on this channel a lot, uh, you know, about uh, fantasy games turning into modern day Los Angeles um, with their the diversity of the people who inhabit it. And yet that is the trend everyone wants. Uh, and I at first I just chalked it up to, well, people are, are doing too much self insertion play instead of mm. playing characters, you know. And, uh, but uh, I don't know. It's just what I'm seeing more and more now. And it, and it's not just in, in TTRPGs. I mean, it's in everything. It seems like there's a, a gray morality that is trying to encompass everything now where the villains are sympathetic and maybe they're not really as horrible as you thought. And they really deserve some sympathy and then some love and they were just misguided or one small event happened to them that turned them into villains and you know one bad day. um yeah the, one bad day <laughs> as of course obviously we are, we are aware of the current trend that you know it, it's you can't make orcs evil and etc uh-huh. and my wife made the comment she said heaven sakes we're running out of and and you know she she's played her share of role playing games and she said we're running out of villains to fight pretty soon what's going to be the point of role playing or we're going to walk into a dungeon and there's nothing in it, but traps. Um, and that is going to be the problem eventually. I mean, but who put the traps there? Some evil well, person. No, I misunderstood. <laughs> right, right. I, yeah, we're, I, I get that there is shades of gray, but shades of gray still has things that are mostly white because no human is perfectly good or perfectly evil, but no. we do a disservice if we if we can't call out evil for evil and good for good. Um, you know, we we can't say everything is morally gray. We just can't. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's I, not even me. That's not even me sounding off on orcs. If if you want good orcs in games, I don't know. You do you do what you want to do in your game. I like evil yeah. orcs. I like Tolkien orcs. <laughs> I really. It do. goes in. It goes in cycles. I think it does. Because, because I remember when it was a you know this revolutionary idea that oh we can have the monsters being more complicated than that. Though I think that goes all yeah. the way back to RuneQuest and Glorantha. But well, and Gazetteer Tin, Orcs of Thar for, yeah. for uh, the Mistara. And set. then and then it comes back around the other way, and you know whatever's out of vogue becomes more interesting to me. Mm. <laughs> but that's me. Well. I mean, you know, I, I I would be the first person who would say it's cool to be able to play monsters, that it's all right to be able to play things that we consider to be monsters. Because a lot of players I know would prefer to play the monsters instead of just the regular old people. I mean, I have one player who staunchly, vehemently refuses to play humans. And his logic mm-hmm. is very simple. He, you know, as, as, he can, as he has told me for the last uh, 30 years... Almost, um, no, and it has been, it's been almost 30, 31 years now. I play a human every single day that I wake up. No. When I play my fantasy, I don't want to play a human. And I understand that. I mean, and that's fine. And I, it's okay to have, um, yeah. a complex 
monstrous character. I mean, you know, one of the most famous examples of that used to be Driz to Erden. I mean, that's you know, exactly the character that comes to mind. Yeah. Yeah. That, you know, this, this idea that, Hey, you can have a, a one-off breakout character who is, who is different from all the other ones and, and sympathetic in their own way. The problem is, is when they all become that way, that's Dritz, Dritz unique nature. Dritz is amazing. I can't even Dritz. Dritz is amazing because of his uniqueness. If everybody is Dritz, then Dritz is no longer amazing. Well, and that's the problem. Dritz yeah. is no longer unique because the, the retcon has gone through and yep. now it's only that one particular city slash sect of drow are evil. All right. the other drow, all three different other branches <sighs> of drow, I might add, right. are all necess- are all good guys or whatever. <sighs> It's just this one little group here that are bad, okay? Don't judge the entire species. And everybody is a special snowflake like Drist. So, yeah, that's. And man, I enjoy playing orcs. Uh, when Orcs of Thar came out, I was I was as jazzed as they come. Um, but I don't want all the orcs to be good. I kind of either want my orc to be a little bit Dristish, but frankly, I still kind of want them to be just dark. I want them to be complicated. Um, I'm an enormous Blake Seven fan. I have still never figured out if the character of Avon, uh, the main character of the show, is a good guy or a bad guy. Um, and and I like that level of complication in science fiction, in fantasy. Um, you know, you brought up the Punisher. Um, mm-hmm. Those characters are intriguing. At the end of the day, I think the Punisher is more good than bad. Uh, but he's broken, and and oh, yeah. and and that's what makes him intriguing but you wouldn't want an entire city of people like the punisher no uh, that's that's what makes him amazing well and and he's Maybe. no longer amazing because they they got rid of him they got rid of him <laughs> i like this lord, i like this lord thoth in the, uh... <laughs> <Yeah>. lord <laughs> thoth one of our panelists who hasn't been on in a while but <laughs> he's uh yeah carrie Avon is amazing i was literally reading a Blake seven book uh, before i got on Staying with you requires a degree of stupidity of which I no longer feel capable. <laughs> <laughs> Episode eight uh, breakdown. I think, yeah, <laughs> that is a great. Chao- that was a chaotic series, even more disorganized than Doctor Who. But there's just I'll- those moments of absolute perfection to it. Even even is fantastic. I'll tell you what. I, I've just uh, you know as to kind of keep it on gaming a little bit. Um, I'm finally sitting down. I'm ha- I'm about two thirds of the way through scum and villainy. And I finally found my, my Blake seven role-playing game. Scum and villainy seems Ooh. perfect. It's a spinoff of it's Blake forged in the dark system. And it is perfect for Blake seven. Um, you might, you might check out blood and coin blood uh, and coin. I'm writing it down. Yeah. Blood and Coin is uh, another one where the characters are not all necessarily good guys, um, and the system reflects it. But they also added some really interesting new rules that uh, you know, even if you if you don't decide to play the game, uh, they're very portable into other OSR systems, uh, okay. which is why I like to explore OSR systems because since it's all kind of interchangeable on some level, eventually. You can pick and choose everything that you want from all the different systems and kind of stick them all into one home system and and make that your thing. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I'm going to tar- I'm going to coin this phrase, everybody out there on the interwebs. So pay attention, listen to me very carefully when I say the OSR salad bar. <laughs> right, because in. that's what it is: the OSR right salad bar. It's it's a case of we have so many good OSR games out there, and of course we do not, we're not able to play all of them all the time. We have to pick and choose which OSR game we want to play. Well, here's the thing. You find the one that you like that has the best base rules, and then you go back and you look at all your other OSR games and you say, what what? What did they do in this particular game that made it unique, special, and cool that I like and I want in my game that isn't already in the base system that I'm playing. And you take that rule and you incorporate it and you keep on moving. You know, everybody gets a little piece of this pie, you know, cause you're, 
by by investigating all these different OSR games, you've actually helped out the creators in their own way, even if you aren't solely playing their game. Right. And, you know, everybody wins. It's a good thing. Just, you know, come come pull up to the OSR salad bar. Pick and choose what rules you like. Throw away the ones you don't want to. Make your perfect game. Do it the way you want. And I, I think most of us Shitted? He shitted his turn? What? What? (laughs) (laughs) Typo. Unfortunate typo. Unfortunate typo. I think most of us pick and choose. I'm I'm looking at the one comment about what's wrong with uh, the Babylon 5 RPG for Blake. So nothing at all. I I never having got quite as big into Babylon 5. uh, For me, there's an awful lot more um, references to it that I don't get because I never... While I've seen the show, I haven't seen a lot. Um, But... But that doesn't mean that you can't pick and choose, of course. And we know this; we all know this. You pick and choose from different games. I'll combine. You know, I'll take I'll take some D and D stuff and throw it in Rollmaster. Certainly, um, well, I one of you know we're here. We are in, in in October and spooky stuff. There's a wonderful, goofy kind of little role playing game called Lost Souls that I love. Mm, uh, I know that one. Do you have Lost Souls? Great, I do. Great ghost game. My my daughter loves it. Um, Man, that is really fun and freakish if you combine it with Wraith the Oblivion. Completely different vibes. Wraith the Oblivion is so depressing. You are going to get sucked into Oblivion. Um, and Lost Souls is just the opposite. You're desperately trying to get reincarnated. You know, ideally at least a lawyer. Um, may, maybe maybe a human, um, but at least, you know, at least a primate or a lawyer. Um, <laughs> and and it's such a fun, lighthearted game. And But the two kind of combine fun. So, yeah, I... I, uh, uh, you know, like, you know, Babylon, uh, you know, we, we combine star star Wars works great for, for sci-fi games. And that's the fun of, I think maybe one of the things that I enjoy about Halloween is that people are more prone around Halloween to run one shots and weird ones. Um, and, and, you know, like I was thinking the other day, I really want to run kobolds ate my baby seriously. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like as dark. Like without the, without the jokes, no, they're eating babies. Um, and it's not funny and we're not going to laugh about it. This is horror. Um, and it would barely take any tweaking to turn it into a horror game. Um, that, that to me would be a fun Halloween game. Yeah, it would. It would. And that is something we haven't really, uh, talked about really is Halloween games or spooky games and all that. Um, my, my difficulty with it. And then Jim's already done a video on it. So he's, a little bit more versed with it than I am is every time I have tried to run a horror game, it either involves extensive amounts of railroading uh, on the GM's part, which all the players hate that. Um, or it, uh, it really requires you to take a lot of control out of the player's hands, a lot of abilities out of their hands that they would normally rely on. And players don't like that either. Um, or, you know, you end up with the, you know, you're, you're trying to achieve a dark moment, you know, mm. as you creep upon the tomb, the dark lights slowly flickering. It begins to open and a clawed hand reaches out. Hey, do you, you pass the Cheetos? Right. <laughs> I got to go take this phone call. <laughs> you know? Or 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 some asshole, you know, does the does the classic, you know, d- cracks up with a with a line from Monty Python, or worse, you get the guy going, cause this is thriller, thriller <laughs> night, and you just like fuck it, I just lost the entire mood. Then you want to just throw shit across the room, and it's just like fuck this, I don't want to. Uh. You have to have people. You have to have people buy into it. Um, one of the one of the comments uh, mm. talks about Wraith. I've been running. I run a LARP Wraith game and have been for years now. Same game. Um, I, that That's the game for me that I just can't put down. Um, but all the players have to know, you know, and, and I don't mind. My players are good. They know that the goal is not to break the mood, but the goal isn't to descend so deep into Wraith. You know, Wraith is one of those games as a, as a really, I think it's the darkest of the White Wolf games. Um, very depressing. Um, but you kind of oh, yeah. des- descend into the darkness and then you kind of come back up. Um, you don't come all the way out that you're making jokes, um, but you, 
it's one of those games where is some stuff is almost better left unspoken. Um, well, you, I, you know, you're descend, you're, you're doom slayers and you're descending into the labyrinth and I'm going to take 30 seconds to describe horrors and then just assume this is going on for the rest of the session because I don't want to, you know, I, I'm not going to try to talk like HP Lovecraft for the next four hours. Um, but, but I'll do it for 30 seconds and then just assume that this continues. Um, man, if, if I remember right, um, and I may actually have this copy of, of this book somewhere, uh, but there was a supplement for Wraith that actually, uh, there was like all kinds of mature content warnings and labels. And I think most of the Wraith stuff did, but this two, one in particular dealt two, with the Shoa. Yeah. Two, two of the books were black dog, uh, dark reflection specters. Yeah. And Charnel houses of Europe, the Shoa. That's Spe yeah. Specters is grotesque. Don't read it in public. The artwork is, is grotesque. Um, and it's very edgy and, and it's supposed to be evil. The Showa. God, I missed that. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 the Showa book, boy, and, and uh, uh, with, with the conflict between Israel and Palestine right now, it really hits home. The Showa <laughs> book is a book about the Holocaust. And it's a very, I, it, it's not meant to shock. It's not meant to disturb. It's just that the Holocaust was shocking and disturbing. Um, and so they did it in, as a black dog book for the purpose of, we don't want to, we don't want to get in trouble if we don't pull punches on the reality of the situation. Um, I would love to run a game, but literally, you know, a couple of months ago, I said to my players, can I use this book? And one of my, one of my players, she's Jewish. And she said, I'd rather you didn't. And I said, yeah. that make, that makes sense. It's off limits. Then we won't, we won't cross that line um, because she's a friend and she matters to me. It, I read the show a book and, and, and I, I cried at the end of it. it it's, it, it yeah. really brought home, some of the travesties of the Holocaust in ways that I hadn't considered. And I think because it's a role playing, it pulled me into it more than some academic book. Um, as you're kind of picturing, what would my character be doing in this situation? It hits you. This is real. Um, maybe not the ghosts part, but otherwise this is a very real situation. And it's horrifying. I, I, in some ways it's one of the best white wolf books because it's so it was handled. I thought it was handled very well. And I don't know that people could do that today. Um, I got a question here to address. Well, actually, a comment um, right here. Uh, Paul Barry says, you know, Wraith never went anywhere, kind of like the rest of Watt. Um, um, well, 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 now, I, this is my thought on that. Um, and I was actually going to ask Mark about that today. Uh, but I was going to ask him, you know, I, I know that he um, <laughs> at one point, became disassociated from white wolf and i was curious as to what was the actual last book that he worked on you know for that company because i i was curious to see because what i wanted to do was take a look at that and kind of have a um kind of like a mental timeline of demarcation from where the point of his leaving the company and the decline of white wolf when it began um because in my opinion, it did it, especially whenever they they kept coming out with newer editions. Like Enwad was horrible. I I mm. cursed the day that Enwad was ever even brought upon this earth. Um, I'm I've played it uh, with. I mean, any game with a good GM who really gets into it, they can they can salvage it. I'm not a fan of Enwad. Um, I tried. Um, I thought the Requiem for Rome books were okay. There were a couple mm -hmm. of there were a couple of Rome books. Mind you, I just convert them to old world of darkness. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It, oh, go ahead. But, but but it just seemed like at at some point, you know, and I, I understand the whole publisher die, uh, you know, mentality of publishers because it's true. I've I've worked with them, um, and I've I've seen how it is. It's like, yeah, you're only as good as your last book. You're only remembered for your last book. Um. But there was kind of a descent into commercialism. Uh, that you could kind of see happening with White Wolf at one point. And um, sometimes the lore would get kind of ridiculous. And I'm, I'm seeing that trend continuing with, with fifth edition, which I don't, I don't buy any fifth edition products. I bought the core book uh, and then it's just kind of like, nah, I'm done. Don't need any more. You know, Grim kind of has kept up with it a little bit better than I did. And I no, think he read the, 
he read the uh you read the sabat core, book that they did core book sabat camarola um and anarch that that's probably where i'm gonna where i'm gonna stop you're talking on, on um, fifth, fifth edition on fifth yeah. edition yeah yeah it's I don't know. It has echoes of the old game, but they tried to do something new with it. Uh, do you? I've I've played it a couple of times. Do you? I a lot of people like the Hunger Die. Um, I'm I'm not sure that that's my favorite thing, um, but I can see why people like it. Maybe if I'd started with the Hunger Die, um, it doesn't it doesn't always make sense um, at, at at the table, um, and that that's the bigger problem with it. I think, um, and I find the combat rules slightly too abstract. Um, for I, because we're often in like in alley fights, street fights, and things. So I kind of want to zoom in on that and have things matter. I, I don't mind zooming out if I'm playing something like Dune or whatever, where you want the sort of grand sweep of a fight, but sort of combining everything into one role it's too certain what what's going on but yeah the the hunger die sometimes it just doesn't make sense and i mean you can ignore it but not if you're playing by the rules um which i don't think any good gms do but it would be nice if the rules made sense in all the circumstances Oh, tell a lie. I have the Inquisition book as well. Do you? There you go. Yeah. Uh, Jason, I, I saw him flicker in and out. But... Oh. Well, we were trying to get Mark here. If uh, Forgive me, uh, Jim, if I seemed a little distracted. I was all excited. Um... <laughs> I, I dropped the, the StreamYard link here in the, in the private chat so you can shoot it to him again. Uh, okay. Let me uh, let's try that again. Yeah. Oh, hang on. Don't you have his... I do have him up on Twitter again, so that's uh, let's see got a link can, there. Let's see what I can do here, and if we don't get him for ten minutes, it's certainly uh, certainly better than nothing. I'll I'll take what he can give me. <laughs> you know what he, uh, <laughs> as you said, will. Yeah, I, I saw somebody flicker in the background and then flicker out, so I'm like, uh oh. Let's see. A shot at doom. Let's see what that does. My problem is, I I think Mark kind of relates to this, although he's better than me. I like to write. I don't. I'm not good at this technology stuff. You guys that do this technology stuff, man, God bless you guys for that. I am <laughs> no good at that. I'm I'm an idiot with this stuff. Um, I I'm not sure I, how I managed to get this far. If I if I did not have help from guys like Animane. Um, with creating shorts and things for me, I would be probably at least a couple hundred, uh, maybe few, like five, six hundred <laughs> subs lighter than I am now. So. I am. Um, I like the comment. I don't know if Mark's backstage or not. I, I like the comment. So I need Jesus in my life to just play Wraith. That is going to be my favorite comment of the day. Um, <laughs> I, I have no comment. I have Jesus in my life and I play Wraith. I'm not saying anybody else has to do that, but it has worked well for me. I don't know. That's a neat, that's a neat concept. Wraith is the one game, it's so depressing, but it's also the one game that has transcendence. Like, Vampire has Golconda, this mythical state that nobody ever achieves. Um, and Mage has Enlightenment, but nobody ever really achieves it in Mage. But Wraith has... a uh, literal train <laughs> that can help you achieve train. You can get on the train, the midnight express, and it can help you achieve transcendence. Um, the concept of these people like Nicholas and the other ferrymen is that they can actually legitimately help you to do it. So it is both the most depressing game, but there's this kernel of hope uh, that is held out that I, I think what makes Wraith very playable. Um, and I can't imagine playing Wraith without that kernel of hope uh, that, that, that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and it may not be And ironically in Wraith, there's a light at the end of the tunnel and it might be a train and that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> so, Oh, uh, let's see. Um, T-shirt. He, uh, yep. 
on, on our on Facebook on our shared message between you, me, and Mark. Can you can you shoot in the link there? I hate to. Do yeah. That. No, I think I, I think I can do that. I see. Um. No, it's okay. I just have to. I haven't logged into that account in a while. Yeah. I, I probably should just because just to see what's going on. We're gonna end up logging them in for like Mark. Thank you for joining us. Time to time to close. Um. But oh, hey, I mean, give me the chance to shoot him a few questions if nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I, I expected more panelists here today and, and that didn't work out. So, you know, it's just us than it is. Well, I, uh, yeah, let's see. There you go. Well, we'll see if he sees it. So. Mark, for those that forgive me, I should have said from the very beginning. So Mark recently moved back to the U.S. with his whole family. Um, and my my understanding is that just that just creates incredible chaos trying to move. Well, not just from overseas, not just from Europe, but in Tbilisi, Georgia, the country of Georgia. I mean, let's be honest, the Ukraine, Russia stuff spills over frequently into Georgia. Uh, it, there's a lot of chaos there. So. That has that has affected a lot of Mark's life, and uh, and there he is. Go, hey boss. Oh, hey, how's it going? Sorry. Hey, Mark. Life has been uh, complicated today. I apologize. I'm I'm so glad to get you back on, man. I'm so happy to see you, and I'm glad you're okay. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, life. Life is uh, extremely complex right now, but uh, hopefully. Uh, it'll resolve itself, but uh, yeah, I moved back to the states. So um, it, it turns out that if you don't have a the State Department or a corporation moving you internationally, it's uh, with a whole family. It's really, really hard. Jeez, <laughs> you know, it's it's insanely hard. And uh, having uh, I don't get too too deep in the weeds here, but yeah, you know, having to deal with. Uh, various governments and properties that are, you know, being seized or whatever. It, it's just, it's just, it's a, it's, it's an unrolling nightmare. Well, like I, I said, I, over soon. well, I know that, uh, yeah, when, when things, uh, broke out over there, I, you know, that was kind of like one of the first questions that started popping up in, uh, in our chat, you know, uh, up on Twitter was kind of like, I hope Mark is okay. So I'm yeah. glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> and they're about to get very dramatic uh, where we were living in Tbilisi. So things are about to pop there. So we, we got out in time, um, you know, but of course, you know, I had stuff going on in Ukraine too. So um, that's just incredibly sad, you know, but that's the nature of the world. Um, shit happens. And uh, I think what Americans, especially, and also the UK, is is that you know and Europe is, is how lucky we are that nothing really major has happened in seventy years, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I reckon you've got at least yeah one more year before things kick off in the states. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I'm an eternal optimist, so I'm I'm hoping that uh, that the silent center majority will will be like yeah. We like dabbling and crazy, but when it comes down to it, we don't really <laughs> want it. I'm hoping that's the case. Hey, I'm Mark, there was a question um, about T-shirt. You're going to have to ask the question about how White Wolf kind of winded thing, wound things, winded, yeah, because I write, wound things down. Um, how was that phrase? Do you remember, T-shirt? Uh, well, my my thought was uh, I I know that uh, Mark and, and White Wolf separated at one point. Uh, That's and, a nice way to put it. Well, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm being I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> I'm trying to be nice. Um, I don't like what happened, obviously, but um, but uh, I was just curious as to what was the actual last work uh, that you did for them because. I, I had this I had this theory this this kind of this line of demarcation between the time that you left the company and uh, the way it went as to like watching kind of like the quality of the products uh, 
drop, you know, not just in uh, quality, but in tone and you know, everything. Yeah. Else. I mean, I mean, that's the, the, I think that's the problem is that the people who took over, mm -hmm. you know, they all felt like they, they understood what white wolf was in terms of like being white wolf at a convention. Right. We're the crazy party guys, you know, ah. we're white wolf and, you know, and I can't deny that I wasn't part of that to some degree. Right. Like, you know, I'm the one who wanted to have big parties and, and, you know, have fun at conventions. And it was all part of my marketing campaign that we're not, you know, like the, when I first joined the game industry, like the big deal was to get big enough as a game company, that you could be invited to the TSR party. Mm -hmm. And you got to hobnob with the cool people, man. And then at some point, I finally got to that party, and I was like, oh, my God, this is the most boring party. And so being a young 20-something, I was like, well, fuck this. This is a stupid party. <laughs> I'm going to have a party that's not for the game industry people. I'm going to have a party for all my fans, and we'll be the cool company, you know? And already, you know, the whole branding of White Wolf and the World of Darkness was – you know, we're young, we're cool. This is what role playing should be. Like, where you know, that was the whole sort of the, the marketing angle was, you know, not only to push people towards storytelling, but to make storytelling cool, right? Because because mm -hmm. intrinsically, storytelling, especially back then, was not cool, right? So how do you make storytelling cool? How do you make how do you make that exciting to the average person? And so we did it through partying. But anyway, the, the white wolf people thought that was the essence of white wolf. And they never understood that the essence of white wolf really was the world of darkness. Yes. And what the world of darkness was and what it meant and, and how it, it, it captured people. And it was designed by me to be very, you know, deep, philosophical, moralistic in the set. Well, I'd say more ethical than moralistic um, and, 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 uh, and about, you know, really big ideas. And they didn't understand that, you know, they didn't. And, and, and I, I have to take some responsibility for hiring, you know, like, like, you, you know, you, you have to be willing to fire people who don't meet your vision. And when I still had the chance to do that, I didn't do that because I wanted to be, the nice guy, you know, and, and then, and then the, you know, those people started collecting and they had a, and once they got enough of a mass, they, they prevented each other from being fired and then it's too late. And then I was kicked out, you know, of my own company. Right. Which, which was actually a really stupid thing, but you know, most of those people, none of those people owned any of the company. So they didn't really care if it went under. Right. That's right. always the problem when you put the fate of a company in the hands of people who don't care if it survives or not, then they do things to suit them, right? Like right. whether you love or hate Elon Musk, you know, Twitter was basically a company, a corporation run for the sake of the people who worked at Twitter, right? And so mm -hmm. it's hard to feel, you know, whichever way you're on that, that, that angle. And I, by the way, I, I, I do both love Elon Musk. I think he's a total jackass. <laughs> but, you know, him coming in at Twitter and, you know, and just firing everyone wasn't necessarily a crazy thing to do in the sense that, you know, they were running that company for themselves and not for profit, you know? Now, of mm. course, Elon, has he made it worse? Yes. <laughs> he made it worse, you know? But but it might have been, it might have gone well, right? And I think my problem was is that I was trying to run this very – you know, for the 90s, especially a very evolved, you know, uh, inclusive, you know, collegial, you know, company that wasn't based, that was based on sharing, profit sharing and all that. And I wasn't, you know, and I should have realized that my main duty was to the product, right? I, Not the employees. I almost kind of wonder. I thought I would have control forever and then I could pivot on a dime. And then suddenly one day I realized, oh, okay, uh, they kicked me out. I have no more power at all. I've lost my baby, you know? And I, that, that actually sent me in this enormous spiral of depression. Like, they, they kicked me out of, like, literally, World of Darkness was my baby. It was my child. Yeah. And them kicking me out of it, I, I was absolutely devastated.
it, it, I nearly killed them. Like, there's no, you know, it did. Like, they, they nearly committed murder on me by doing that. They did. I can imagine. Um, well, if it, for what it's worth, you know, yours is still the vampire that we play. I, we don't, we don't do NWOD. We definitely don't do fifth edition or any of that other stuff, man. It's just, it's old school. If it's, if it doesn't have the old Tim Bradstreet art, you know, <laughs> then it's, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> it ain't my, it ain't my vampire. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What, what I hate about where it went and I like white wolf and I like some of the later books, but early vampire had so, and, and the other world of darkness games, Wraith, there was so much mystery. Uh, it wasn't, Every every corner was not explored for you. That was left for the GM to fill in the gaps. And later, White Wolf told you everything. Told you who the true Black Hand was, who was the Inkanu, what were they really doing. All all the secrets were so gone. And then, of course, all your players read it, read everything. Oh, yeah. Was, yeah. Was no, later, World of Darkness had no mystery. And what I like about Mark and what I like about working in Lost Lorne is that with Lost Lorne, he's not letting us explore every corner. Um, there are going to be mysteries still. We're not going to do this thing where, okay, here's everything because that takes away all the fun. And in World of Darkness, there were things like there are hardcore rules that were in the Bible. Like there will never be a Gehenna, you know? <laughs> that was a hardcore <laughs> rule. It will never, ever happen. You know, we will never explain the origins of, of vampires fully. It will always be mythic. Well, that was in the Bible that I wrote. Like, you know, there's things you never, ever explain because because I knew that if you explain it, like it will it will ruin the mystery immediately. And Absolutely. so, you know, but of course, as I kicked out, they were like, I mean, of course, for most creative people, like, you know, if you, if you can give yourself an assignment to write something, right, what are you going to give yourself? <laughs> you're going to give yourself the assignment because you're not thinking globally you're thinking in terms of oh i want to do this assignment what's the coolest thing to write about oh gahanna oh the, the <laughs> truth of the origin of vampires right but that's the one thing of course if you're thinking globally you should never do because then because then suddenly you're defining the source material in a way that um isn't realistic because in real life of course we will never know the truth of the history of humanity unless it turns out of course the aliens have been watching us for since the dawn of time but even <laughs> that we won't know because they could be lying to us right <laughs> you know <laughs> we'll never know like 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 the truth of, of the you know for the lay person the truth of the pyramids is kind of like you know i mean i don't think there's much secret to the, the pyramids but to, to a lot of people, there's the idea that oh, the pyramids are, are they actually made by aliens and you know all this insane. Well, don't stuff. you know they were they were for holding grain? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because yeah, the the most economical way to hold grain is to build a <laughs> build a few hallways in a giant giant amount. Yeah. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. Put put some traps in there, and you know, just well, well, just use the extra space to bury some kings. You know, hey, well, why the, not? the traps yeah. are to stop the uh, rats and mice eating the grain. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There, there we go. That, that's yeah. what's, what's that line from Hitchhikers? <laughs> but like, but like, myth, the whole point of, of myth is that myth is beautiful because you never know how true it is. It just is a story. It's purely a story that is a mystery, and and you got to have that, and that's what I think we're doing very well in uh, um, in um, in this new project. Lost <laughs> is <Lord>. that <laughs> lost? Lord. Sorry, you, you've lost had Lord. a long, you, you've had a rough day. I know. <laughs> I had a very rough day. I had a very rough I'm day. Uh, is that is that is that we're, we're we have another Bible, but this time I think everyone understands how important that Bible is. And and of course it's set in stone this time, you know. We I we will. demand rigidly defined areas of doubt and uncertainty. That's <laughs> yeah, that's it. Like, yes, I, like that's and, and it's amazing how TV shows and, and like the MCU and all that they make the same mistake. Yes, right? like, yes. like like all, all these all these shows make the same. Either they don't create their world in enough depth, which is a classic problem of of settings and role playing games, right? Like I've right. always thought, like like World of Darkness set a hurdle 
right? Why doesn't everyone else create a world just as complicated? That That's what obviously people want in role-playing games. They want a very fleshed out world. And at the same time, they don't want it too fleshed out in certain ways. You want, right? So you can go in enormous depth into like a particular tavern or a particular castle, right? You just can't go into enormous depth in the origins of shit, right? Because you got to keep the mystery. But you can go into enormous, you know, detail on things. It just shouldn't explain too much, right? But everyone seems to have missed that lesson. Not just in role-playing games, but in computer games and TV and movies. You know, this at, at the MCU is just just went off the rails, right? They they could have kept that going for their twenty years, and they completely fucked it up by yes, you know, I by going understand. completely wrong, <laughs> like, yeah. like 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 not you know like like your setting comes first. Like and whatever the MCU is saying philosophically and, and ethically and about and and culturally, right? That's what it's saying. You don't try to force it into a box and make it say this. You let it speak for itself. It's a living thing. Um, yeah. Actually, actually, that's a thing I've been thinking a lot about lately. Is that uh, I'll just I haven't told anyone this new idea I've had the last two days, but um. But I think the one problem with modern culture is that we think everything in very mechanistic ways. Like we're trapped in this Newtonian physics way of seeing the world. So we see everything as, you know, force, reaction, orbits, you know, things flying into each other. Every, so everything's mechanistic. It's, it's mechanical. And so we see science as mechanical. But yet if you look into science and even math, we're already in the quantum era, Right. Right. Like true science is completely not about that. We're in, you know, Einstein and, and quantum are well different and well beyond Newtonian. You know, when people think of science, you can see in their head how they're thinking. They're thinking, you know, force and response, reaction. Everything can be calculated. Everything's very precise. And it's not that way. Like, like and so I think that we're, we're we, modern humans, we tend to think of the world like in human beings, especially as machines, and the brain is a machine, and 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 it's not cult like culture and society and people is a giant living organism, and and honestly, we have very limited ideas of what an organism is. We don't really understand, you know, like like people don't even know. This is not even common knowledge that our sense of smell is quantum based. Like people don't even know that, and they think that oh. It's, <laughs> It smells it, but it's quantum based. Like you have two molecules that are exactly identical, and we smell them as different things because they're all factory nerves. The very base of them can detect between the quantum states of those two identical molecules. They smell different to us, so that means yeah. the entire yeah. brain, the entire our, our entire bodies are quantum. Like there's mysteries within mysteries going on here. We're living organic things, and everything around us is living and organic. That's the fine. whole world, of course, is Gaia. Anyone who's read any of my books knows that I truly believe in that. Like, the world is obviously a giant living organism, right? There's no doubt about it. Is it conscious or not? Well, probably not, but maybe, right? You can't you can't say it's not, right? No, you can't definitely. Not. You know, do I believe it is? Not really. Do I think it could be, and I don't know about it? Oh, hell yeah. Anyway, that's my little rant. Sorry. Cool. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah, technocratic propaganda. I saw that. That's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, but, then no, so. <laughs> but, but there's definitely, that's that's really, I think, the, the issue with the modern world is that we think of everything mechanistically. We don't realize that we're dealing with life forms. That, that culture is a life form. If we kill off our culture, which, you know, mm. and, and you know, I'm a lefty, but, but but a lot of lefties and hard righties want to kill off culture now and change everything and start anew. And it's like, yes. you can't just kill a living being and start new, right? You got you to gotta birth a new thing and then raise that, right? And, and if you kill the, 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 the organism that you're living inside of, well, then... You don't have an organism to live inside of, you know, like, like we're the microflora 
of, of Western culture, right? We're living in the gut of Western culture. And if Western culture dies, well, we're not, we don't, do, we won't do very well outside the gut, you know? <laughs> My ancestors came over on the sandwich. <laughs> one, one of the things that, uh, reason Mark and I get along as well as I think that we do, um, uh, Mark said a minute ago, he's a lefty and I'm, I'm definitely more of a righty by far, but both of us are, are quite into, um, libertarianism, free, free thought, um, yeah. get off, get off my yard. You, you, do, your, you do your thing. I'm going to do my thing. Leave me alone. And I, what we've discovered certainly is that we can respect, if we can respect each other and, and agree to disagree, we're good. It's the people that refuse to let you agree to disagree. It's the people that say, I think this way and you do as yeah. well. And you're a terrible person if you don't agree with me. And there's just no, there's no room for, and gaming, there are people that want to do that in gaming. Back to the orcs. Your, my orcs are good and your orcs have to be good as well. No, no, they don't. Yeah. Um, that, and that's, that's where the big divide is coming. And that's why left, right doesn't matter as much anymore as authoritarian and freedom. Um, I don't, well, I, I don't mean that to sound like totally political, but I mean, that really is what it's, it's heading into. No, we, we, we've hit this because it's like, we, we hit the culture war all the time on this channel. Um, Grim is on the left and I also consider myself to be on the left. Am I as far left as Grim? No, because firearm good. Is anyone? I, I live. <laughs> I live in. I live in Texas, man. We, you know, we we have the, you know, we have the open carry law. You know, we, you know, you want to walk around with your katana strapped on and your M sixteen, do it. But uh, you know, just do I'm it responsibly. Quite, I'm not quite all the way down in the bottom left corner of the political compass. So theoretically, there's space for someone to be more. Uh, left yeah, more no, I, I think I think you, you're gonna you're gonna trouble regularly for not being left enough, right? <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I ironically, like, 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 yeah, it's it's very funny. Like, you cannot be left enough for some people, right? And well, you that, cannot that be right enough for some people. Uh, um, people, the, my friends on the right are all the time are saying, "Yeah, I'm I'm getting called out all the time for not being for being a rhino, which is you know Republican in name only, you know, <laughs> because if you don't agree with everything the, the radicals say, then you're out, and it, it's actually." It's a problem because, right? because you know, in the long run, what you really want is you want you want change in society, but not so rapid that it dissolves society. Because if it dissolves society, people die. Yeah. Right. And any person who reads history knows that radical change leads to terrible, terrible things. You know, may you live in interesting times of that Chinese curse that everyone's heard of. And, and that's because of radical change, you know, um, and you want and, and, and to have sustainable changes, sustainable things getting better. You want it to be slow enough for everyone to catch up and get along. Like, for instance, now, correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, but but like you have gay people in your church now, right? Uh, we have some that have attended. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so and so and, and they're accepted, right? I, you know what? They they deserve to live with dignity, and yes, they 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 uh, absolutely yeah. treat them as people. And you brought it up, and I'll say I, I may not agree with them on some of their life decisions, but it's their it's their life to live, and it's their decision to make. And we can agree to we can agree to disagree, and they're still welcome to come. And we and we've told them you're still welcome to come to church. We'd still, uh, uh, you know, we hope that you feel welcome here. Um, I don't. And this is a radical everything. change for what it was. Like my parents were so left in the '80s that my father was almost fired from his church, and yet in the '80s. And by the way, they both denied this. My dad, the day he died, he used to say, "Love the sinner, hate the sin." Absolutely. Right? And he was like, "I never said that." I never well, I, said but that. I've said that. I tell my mom, and I go, "You used to say that." They like deny it, you know. No, but, and, but that and, and, Things were completely, even a left-wing church back then, in the 80s, it was not acceptable to have, to allow gay people to attend. It wasn't. But that's that's what tolerance actually looks like. Right? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Not, not agreeing. Absolutely. In practice. Someone not agreeing, but respecting. Yeah. In practice, that is it. It's saying, I don't approve of you necessarily. I don't. You know, uh, I don't even know that I like. The, I don't even know that I like. To but, but you know what? I accept you here now. Yeah, and I accept you as a human being, and I respect you as a human being. Yes. You know, 
on the political and, and, and it's sort of like I think it's it's about your, poli- your politics should not matter when you're no. dealing with people, right? Like 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 right and your politics never excuses bad behavior. Right. Like no. right now, everyone seems to be convinced that their politics excuses whatever horrible thing they do to someone, canceling them or hurting them, ratting them out, doing whatever. If they have if, if it's their politics is against them, that gives them carte of long to do anything. And the truth is, we need to go back to when your politics excuses nothing. That your value as a human being, your dignity as a human being is, is described by your ethical comportance. And you, your politics gives you the right to do nothing. Nothing at all. And if you use your politics to excuse your behavior, then you're on the path of evil. You are. You know? Mm-hmm. Because all the great evil in the world happened with people streaming politics and doing something crazy and ending up killing people. That's how it always happens. How communism ended up killing, you know, hundreds of millions of people. That's how, you know, fascism ended up killing hundreds of millions of people. It's always how it happens. Yeah, you indeed. Saying, you were saying earlier how um, sort of your world philosophy influenced your work on World of Darkness. Does it influence Lost Lawn in the same way? And oh, you were trying to promote 100%. storytelling. Oh yes. And and you were trying to promote storytelling with with World of Darkness. Um, are you trying to promote anything new with Lost Lawn? Some some new approach. Here's the thing: I'm not, I'm not I'm not trying to. Can we your phone? Uh, <laughs> is that Vivian? It's also, yeah, Vivian, come say hi. Hi. Hey, Vivian. <laughs> it's it's in, it's in my jacket out there. The, the plaid jacket with the red stripes. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. No, no. That's when I had a well thought out question as well. Uh, um, so, so, so the thing about like, like, I hate that kind of question, even though it's a very good question, a very hard question, I should say. You should never, <laughs> by the way, say a question is a very good question because that's patronizing and, and ingratiating. <laughs> Instead, you should always say that was a very hard question. Because that's the truth, and it's it's more honest, and it's also more real. Okay, um, but but I would hate to have Lost Lauren be like this is Mark's latest politics, and he's pushing his politics. That's <laughs> not how it is, right? It's not about my politics. It's about what I'm thinking about in terms of basically philosophy. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's about my Weltanschauung. Which is the German word for worldview, right? It's it's how hmm. that worldview is interacting with my life and how I'm seeing the world now, and I want to express that in an artistic way. So it's not my politics. My the older I get, the less interested I am in politics, right? Like like I don't think it's a worthy. Like I've completely stopped arguing politics online entirely. I don't do it at all anymore. And it took me years to wean myself from that, but I realized that I was hurting people. And I don't believe in hurting people, you know, and I love arguing politics. I do, or I did, but I just don't want to do it anymore because it's just a dead end, right? Especially in modern culture, like with my dad and my uncles, we could argue for days about politics and it was always fun. Like I remember one time my dad and his brothers were arguing about politics and then one uncle left who was the one who was arguing on the side. And my dad just switched sides so they could keep <laughs> arguing. That's funny. Like after three hours, he just flipped. And I went, Dad, I, I was reading my book. I go, Dad, you can't just switch sides like that. He goes, Why not? <laughs> I don't make any sense. You were just on the other side. You can't just switch like that. He goes, Oh, Mark, grow up. <laughs> well, you know, and- it's. That's what I've always told people. Is this kind of like you know? That's that's the sign of maturity. Is the is the ability to be able to change your mind based on new information. Uh, but you know, yeah, it is what yeah. it is. Um, yeah, I mean, that really wasn't what he was doing. What he was showing me, I thought, and and I think he was showing me in a way, um, is that you know, the whole dialectic thing, the debate thing. You know, if you get too involved in it and you believe in your own ideas too much, if you believe in yourself too much, you're going to be led led astray. 
And the only way to do it right is to sort of hold these ideas so loosely that you can flip on a dime. And that, that should be valued. Whereas right now, because we live in this, going back to the Newtonian thing, we believe in the world that's like rigid and structured. And, oh, if you flip, you're a flip-flopper. You're a bad person. And really, if you look at it, it as our you know, a society and culture and yourself as an organic being, like flip-flopping is actually virtuous, right? It, it, you know? Now, you shouldn't flip-flop on people, right? You shouldn't suddenly go from, you know, I love you, I hate you, I love you, I hate you. That's that's different. But when it comes to ideas, playing with ideas and being willing to change your mind, that, that's a valuable thing. And not necessarily on all ideas, but on some ideas, it's a very valuable thing. Uh, T-shirt's listing some questions, so I'll just ask one more while we're waiting for people to offer some up. Um, so we were talking earlier about, but before you came on, about how the sort of art and presentation mm. of RPGs has changed. Mm. Um, in that you now have these very intensely artistic books like Morkborg and, and so on. Uh, we mentioned boutique games like K Kingdom Death, things like that. Yeah, as White Wolf, I think you advanced the art form. Yes, uh, of gaming with the yes. emphasis on storytelling, and you basically made salon laps a thing. Yeah, where else do you think we have to go at this point? Where would you like to see gaming go? I mean, I love Mark Borg, but it's skin deep, right? Yes, it's very polished and fashionable, but it doesn't have the depth of, like, let's say, an early White Wolf book that had not only for its time the flash and sizzle, but it also had like, oh, wow, there's a whole world growing in front of my eyes that's real and alive. And, you know, and I think World of Darkness from a very early point, from the very first vampire game, the World of Darkness felt like a living thing, right? It felt like you were watching a baby being born, I think, is the, what mm. people used to say to me. Like, I can't believe I'm part of this, man. It's so cool, man. <laughs> Thank you, man. This is like alive, man. I you know, I would hear that a lot. I'm, I'm <laughs> trying to channel like a very excited '90s kid. Uh, oh, that, that's why you that. throw the parties, right? People get a few drinks in them, they get loose. They tell you, <laughs> no, so. you know, that, that, was, that was a big part of it back then. You know, and and I, and I think part of the drinking and the partying for me was that I I'm actually a shy person, so for me to interact with all these people, you know, and be able to role, you know, manage like these huge LARPs and I was running around the world running 300 person LARPs. The only way I could do it was with a drink in my hand. You know, the only way I could deal with a big, a lot of people around me was with a drink in my hand. I, I can't without alcohol. I don't like crowds at all, you know? <laughs> so wow. alcohol was just my way of dealing with it, you know? And, um, uh, and alcohol is, is a very bad drug. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, I love it. I still love it. Um, but but um, you know it's just not healthy. You can't you can't be drinking all the time. It's, it's going to kill yeah. you. You know yeah, I've developed expensive taste to help cope. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 that's a good coping mechanism. Is that I switch to whiskey now, and I only drink expensive whiskey, and so I can't afford it. So you know, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got a got a super chat for Mercurius Olicus for. Uh, Australian two dollars is for the tip jar man. Hey, thank you. I appreciate you. Absolutely. Um, and of course, you know, like, yeah, if you've uh, if you want to throw us some super chats and super stickers, man, we're we're not to a hundred yet, so I'm not going to get paid next month. <clears throat> but uh, but, but I, I do want to finish the question that uh, Grim Grim threw at me. If, if I can interrupt, or am I interrupting? Sure. No, oh, you're good. good. So, so I think that you know. Like, I feel like we're in the same position right now that we were before White Wolf came in. There was all these new games coming up, and they're all, like, cool and stylish and different and experiment different ways because TSR was dying at the time, right? In the early 90s, TSR mm -hmm. was on its deathbed. It was really not doing well. and People were dying for something new. And I think right now people are dying for something new. And I think with TSR right now, um, 
basically switching to an entirely digital format. They're giving up on game stores. They're giving up on even physical magic cards. The actual magic cards they're producing are so thin. You know, they're barely cards anymore. It's more like magic papers, you yeah. know? Um, <laughs> uh, 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 and, and so they're giving up on the physical stuff. And so I, I think it's going to leave, you know, a whole that to everyone else. Because I think the physical gaming with people is a real thing. You know, and, and I think being face to face with someone in the same room is completely different from dealing with them online. Right. Like if we're all four of us in the same room right now, we would be picking up on things they wouldn't do. But it's beyond just body True. language and all that. I believe there's a, you know, just like smell has a quantum basis that there's probably some level. I'm not saying that we're, you know, the precognition, all that kind of stuff. But I'm just saying there's some level of interaction that probably goes on that we don't have any clue of what it is or how it works yet but being face to face with someone and and in person with someone is a completely different experience and it cannot go away it will not go away and and even if if everyone you know and probably the people who all go online too early will go extinct because they won't have sex anymore they won't have kids and they're gonna be gone (laughs) and the people who inherit the earth will be nigerians and the amish Okay. <laughs> That's my next game, Mark. We're going to do that as a, as a role playing. A post oh, no. game of Amish and Nigerians. Oh, God. Well, or you could just start playing Coyote and Crow where all the right. Europeans uh, are gone. I think Degenesis so, 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 is nearly Nigerians and Amish. So Nigerians and Amish is, is 100 years away, right? But, but in the short term, I think the role, there's going to be a very strong movement to still meet a person and to still role play and have dice. And this will be like a break from this digital world that is, is just so hard to deal. Like we, people are going to crave being with people. Like even if you don't have sex, you still want to be with people, right? You want to be around people. You want to have that collective collaborative experience. And so I think games that are super simple with rules so that anyone can start playing quickly and it gets people together is going to be very, very big. And I think we're going to break the paradigm of either LARP or small group in someone's home. And we're going to find this middle level, which is going to have like 20 people coming together at a party. And that party is going to be a role-playing game experience with light rules. I think that's going to be the perfect mixture because let's face it, running a LARP with a hundred people is really hard. Running LARP with 30 people is hard. (laughs) That right there. There. (laughs) Amish the churning. (laughs) All right. We got our, we got our first uh, super chat question here from uh, K Mike, who's a friend of ours and is uh, one of our players in our Sunday game. Um, But for four nine nine, thank you, Mark or K Mark. K Mike. K Mike. (laughs) Sorry. We're hard. Um, this is Mark. Do you or did you ever have a personal answer to any of the big wad questions, or do you not even want to put that out there? Like, what are the big wad questions? Like, which is my favorite clan, or or it, what, what's it, the truth, or yeah, what's the, something? Is there a really? Was Golconda real? Who was the first vampire? Maybe I don't know. I, those. What are, was the deal with Saulot? Would be mine. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean. I mean Honestly, I always had like my idea of what that would be, and and you know I did sometimes share that with people in the company, which I shouldn't have done. What what I should have done is I should have said that hey, I have my idea of those, but because it's in the Bible, that we'll never have an answer. I'm never going to talk about it because if I say anything, it's like me saying what my favorite clan is, right? And I don't have a favorite clan, and and actually, you know, I don't like you know. And, and, and so that's that's the most common question I hear is, what's your favorite clan? And I don't have one because they're all my children. I love them all equally. Um, <laughs> and, and, and and But it would detract from someone else's enjoyment if I did say something, even as a joke. And so answering those big questions is like, that's ruins an IP. You know, that's exactly what you should never, ever do. You know, yeah. and the person who created the IP has the biggest responsibility to never ever answer those questions because then it could lead people away from enjoying it as much as they could otherwise. There should always be central mysteries that are never answered. Well, always. okay. And then K Mike does list some of his questions. And this is well, this one is one of mine as well. Uh Saulot, 
That is such a weird and mysterious character. I mean, did you even make the Salubri, or was that your idea, or because that uh, so that was the was, neatest was hmm? was, was my uh, I was pushing for something like that, and but I did not actually come up with that. Oh, okay. Uh, it was sort of like a hole that I said this needs to be filled at a later point. And and I, I said this someone needs to do this. Here's what it kind of needs to be. I set up a, a bunch of sort of general guidelines, and it was filled up by by um, I forgot the name of who did it. Now was that Robert Hatch? Yeah, it may have been maybe an Andrew. I'm not sure. Hmm. Yeah, or I maybe I did it. Forgot. I mean, honestly, a lot of times I'll say someone else did something, and then someone will go, "Oh no, you you did that," and I'm like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> I, you know, I lost more. I, I, re I really don't have, you know, I don't take. It, it, my ego is not based on what things I made up or not, right? You know. Oh gosh, we got we got people like explain Baba Yaga, explain the Nick Tuku. I'm, I don't think Mark had anything to do with the Nick Tuku. I, I think that shit was later. That yeah, was probably. That, that, um, that was kind of the proto Nosferatu, Mark. Yeah, and oh, actually, right. okay. that is something I, I wanted to comment on, too, is the fact that that is something that kind of irritated me as time went on. It just seemed like more bloodlines and more clans kept popping up uh, over time. And I'm just kind of like, where, where the fuck were these guys before? Well, they were hiding. Yeah. Uh, well, that was even also my, my Bible is, is don't have new stuff add in just add more subdivisions of the existing clans and you can have yeah. a few new clans, but you add, you know, you have subdivisions of the existing clans, you have new, you know, histories. And as much as possible, you do things that are not like, like the book of Nod, you know, gives you deep background, but you know, in it, but it's an original source. And usually you don't know how much of it is to be taken, you know, verboten or not. Right. Right, and, and so that that's how you you provide content, and you can sell stuff without without ruining it for people. Because it, as soon as you explain oh, something that yeah, really, and, and it doesn't exist in the real world, there, there's a reason why Wikipedia is so you know used to be so loved, and now it's so hated. Is it because it's so easily manipulated? Mm -hmm. Right, every billionaire ha hires a company. That manipulates Wikipedia for them and it manipulates their setting. Every company manipulates their own file, right? Like, like you know, it's all fudge and manipulated. We don't have encyclopedias anymore because no one, you know, it, it doesn't really make sense anymore to have this authoritative, like, we are the truth of the world. Like, no, it, it's obvious that no one has the truth of the world. No one. True. Right? Um, and, and, so, it, and so when games try to provide that, that's not realistic. It's not true to the world. You know, that no, not, no two human beings in the world agree on any, everything, right? You got two people in the same religion who go to the same synagogue or, or mosque or whatever, and they will, not, <laughs> they will not agree on religious truth, much less moral truth or anything else, right? Absolutely. If you... The deeper you dig into it, the more that are going to disagree on what the truth is. And so in and a game, yeah? Oh, I was going to say, yeah, uh, kind of in relation to that, that that is something that has kind of pissed me off, is the fact that um, a clan that did pop up later were called the Nagaraja. Uh, and I, I have no idea. I think you, I don't think you were there at the time when they I did. Never, but I would never call it something that. Yeah, but uh, I I recently saw that in fifth edition, yeah they they actually came up with another clan beyond that that kind of retcons the Nagaraja. And I'm just like, what the fuck, guys? Seriously, I, a comment was made earlier that it jumped the shark with True Bruja. That, as memory serves, that was the yeah. book Dirty Secrets of the Black Hand, and I would agree that mm -hmm. that was the book that you read it and you went, oh gosh, these are all the secrets in one book, and at first it's cool and then back to the never let the players look behind the screen mm -hmm. all your players read it and so now it's not cool anymore because you got no secrets to work with yeah because and, I mean, and, that, and, that's, and that's the number one reason why not to, to do the deep background reveals is that if your players read it it's gonna it makes it harder for the game master and the, the whole point 
of role playing is is to make it easier for the game master because it's one of the hardest jobs in the entire world, right? Yeah. Like yeah. like being a game master is a very very difficult job to do. Oh yeah. If you make it harder for them, then it makes role playing even more fraught and difficult. Definitely. K, K like, Mike said I played one. I'm I'm assuming he's talking about Nagaraja. And I, I and hear hear me. I love Old Clan Zemiske, so I enjoyed that parts of that book. Um, but man, it just it it gave away so much mystery. And then you talk T-shirt about the retcons. There's a recent Talma Hey Rob book. Yeah, tried, tried to retcon it again, and yeah, fifth edition with the Hecate and that. And just, it just the retcons make it more confusing. I, I mean. Um, yeah, that like is this was it was it the uh, the mother of skulls and all this other shit started kiosked and everything started popping in and I'm just kind of like what where the hell is all this man we're when, yeah this is, the, this is the problem with, with with people coming in trying to redo and do a new edition is they want to is that they think their job is to change not only the rules but the setting mm. and what I what I told the people in fifth edition is like redo the rules go to town, but play a very light hand on the setting. Otherwise you're going to ruin it. And they and did. The and, 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 and of course they made the same mistake that they did with four and three is that, is that they, they fuck with the, the, you know, and it's like, you know, it, it's just such a classic mistake. Like it's a ho mistake Hollywood used to do. You used to take a novel, right? And they go, oh, this novel's not right. I'm the screenwriter. I know everything. I'm I'm the director. I'm way smarter than the, some novelist. And I'll do it my way. And then, of course, they ruin the, the source material. They ruin it. And then it took people going, no, I'm a Harry Potter fan. Don't ruin the tone of Harry Potter. And so they were very, very <coughs> careful not to change the stories of Harry Potter. And even though maybe and sometimes that was was a mistake, it kept the fans happy. The fans protected the source material. The trouble is the fans never had a strong enough voice for these new things that, and the fans didn't quite realize that, no, the, the, the original way is, is maybe the best way. You know, I it certainly is the way so. that works. You know, mm -hmm. and don't, so, so, so change the rules, change the presentation, redo the art, but when it comes to setting, you should do as little as in the story. Like, like change it very delicately. You mm. should change it. It's not a problem. But but be delicate. You know. I think I'm starting to see why Kevin Crawford doesn't release a lot of extra setting shit for his books. But because yeah, you're yeah. right. Um, yeah, people have an ego, right? And so when someone works on a project, they want to make it their own, even if it belongs to someone else. Like that human ego thing comes in and you want to do it as, well, here's what I did to it. This is my twist, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and generally, if your ego is that involved in something, you're going to ruin it. Uh, well, we've got our, our first question coming out of Legion of Myth. Well, actually, it's really our second question. Um, he says, storytelling means different things to different people. What does it mean to Mark and Jay? He says, ask, I ask because some think I'm a story game, yet I typically don't like that concept or what that implies. Um, and I think what, what, he, what he's trying to say is uh, Max is usually is very much about you know mechanics and things still making a difference hmm. and not just glossing over things like you know dice rolls and stuff. But he still likes to have a, a good story in his games. If I can, while Mark was talking, I was kind of thinking about an answer. And so if I can, for me, <laughs> and, and I'll, I'll be brief because people want to hear Mark. I enjoyed in Space 1889, they had random rules for how many NPCs die in a spaceship crash. But, they, but for PCs, it's how much damage you take because they yeah. said, in PCs don't die random deaths in the middle of an adventure in a spaceship crash. That just doesn't tell a story. And I like that. Um, I run LARPs with one of the writers from New Wad. Um, uh, Sean wrote the San Giovanni Bloodline, among other things. Mm -hmm. And he frequently, and, I, and he's, a good, he's a very good storyteller, and he frequently said, uh, will tell players, we're not going to promise not to be harsh to you, 
But I want to know as we go into the into this game, what story do you want to tell with your character? Um, and to me, that's what a storytelling game does. It's not there's some give and take. That doesn't mean the player won't die or that the character won't die. Um, the character may still die. Terrible things will happen. That's what makes the game. It's still World of Darkness. But uh, there's a partnering. And it's not just, um, you know, oh, random die, you lost your character in the middle of a game. Uh, we'll do that if you signed up for that. I'm not against that if every player's on board for, hey, you know, there might be a TPK in the middle of the of a game. But to me, a storyteller game is more partnering. And I think that you can do that with any game. I think you can do that with old school mm. uh, games. Uh, I think if everybody's on the same page, it becomes more storyteller and less um, dictation. And your and, and your characters are kind of mm. uh, at the mercy of not getting some... They're, they're just more board game pieces, I think, versus um, part of the story that's being told. So that's that's my answer. It may not be the right answer, but it's my answer. Okay. For, for some players, you know, no matter how lightly you paint on storytelling, they're going to object because they want the rules to express objective reality. And, and you know, the, the rules have to decide what happens and all that, right? And so there is like a, you know, uh, a kind of a, a fake out going on with most game mastering, right? Where you're trying to create a, a beautiful story and a powerful emotional story, but still make them feel like, like it is real. And the way we do real and role playing is the dice decide, right? Like, like that's kind of how we express the sense that, Oh wow, this is real. This is really happening as we sort of let the dice decide. And we give players the, the power to determine what they do. So the players are free. That's why, you know, these d coded dungeons where, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like a, you know, you're a railroad dungeon style, right? <laughs> a to B to C to D uh, is not fun. No. Nope. Because it basically is like a computer game, right? You know, an old style computer game, certainly. And, and the new style, they hide it well, but it's still the same kind of thing, really. You know, even when it's open world, Right, it still has these stories within it that are A to B to C to D. Yeah, um, points. <laughs> yeah, and, and and so you've got to kind of fake them out. But really, what storytelling in a game is is that yes. it, it's just as a as a players and as a game master, you're just really focused on all the ingredients of a great story, and you're really pushing those to the front and forefront of what you're doing, what you're talking about. So it's, it's not, so combat is in there, but it's not the key thing because that's, that's, you know, that's for special moments and for getting the tension, but to build up to that, the, the way to make combat really powerful and to have an emotional re reaction to it and, and to be very passionate about the outcome, you have to have all these storytelling things build up to it, you know, character, um, plot, plot twists, all the different elements of a storytelling. Right, those all have to be put in there, and to do it properly, not only does the game master, the, the storyteller, have to be deeply involved in that, but the players do as well. And that's tricky, right? It's an art form, you know. Most people can't do that. If you have newbies, oh my god, I, I was just playtesting Lost Learn, you know, uh, Fang Night with a bunch of newbies, and it was very hard. And they're teenagers to boot. Uh, there were students of mine in my storytelling class. So literally, I was teaching them about storytelling during the day at this private academy, which my kids were attending in Tbilisi. And then, it, and then the evenings were, were role playing. So you'd think they would get the storytelling, but they did not. But by the end of the year, they did, right? Because little mm -hmm. by little, it would teach them what it meant and move them towards that style of playing. And, and so it's you know it's an art form and it's a collaborative art form. And that's maybe why role playing will never be this huge, at least our style of role playing will never be this huge thing. Because, you know, what is it? Like like one in ten people literally can't imagine things in their head. Hmm. Like, like that's actually a thing that they cannot hmm. visually imagine a thing. And for, like, like like my son has a friend who if you tell him apple, he cannot imagine an apple in front of him 
and see the colors and describe it to you. He does he does not have an imagination. Doesn't have it. Cool ass kid does not have an imagination. He cannot therefore role play. Right? I've seen There's a lot of kids like people. this. Yeah, especially nowadays. Right? Because they miss that developmental window, right? Like children mm -hmm. have these developmental windows for all these different things. And for some reason in the modern world, we don't think imagination matters, right? We put phones in the hands of little kids. They don't have an imagination anymore. That's right. And, and what's, and what is the number one superpower that Einstein had, that Elon Musk had, that all these, that Newton had, all these most famous scientists, they all had imagination and they could visualize their ideas as visual, you know, mental experiments, right? Imagination is incredibly important and yet a lot of people don't have it anymore and role playing we're going to keep that shit alive right it's and we we teach people how to be have an imagination and we teach people how to visually see things and and, and yeah. so so that's how storytelling is so important because we're we're using all these different tools but it's not just one thing it's it's all the different layers of storytelling yeah, and he, he expands on it by saying, yeah, he likes emergent storytelling with the setting coming first, characters do in the setting, decisions, interactions, and dice rolls to create the story. So I agree. Yeah. That's and by the way, my new theory is is that storytelling is the basis of human consciousness. I right? agree there's, with this. There's, 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 no, there's no doubt that that our, we tell a story about ourselves and our life, and that is kind of the that thread of that story about ourselves is our ability to see outside of ourselves, you know, and that's kind of what consciousness is. And, and um, there's, you know, so, so consciousness is really an understanding ourselves as individuals. It's all about storytelling, you know, storytelling. I think we had storytelling first and then we became conscious. Hmm. Um, we got another question here from Adino, the Ez Knight. He says, uh, do you feel there are new directions to go in RPGs? Like, will we ever see the growth or imagination like we saw in 80s or 90s? I would probably just say no, because it's become too commercialized. But what do you say, Mark? I think yes. I think that um, because T uh, Woods of the Coast is leaving the, the table stop space and they don't care about it anymore, I think that's going to leave a void. And I think uh, there are people who want to see something else. Now, it'll be a small hobby initially, but if, as soon as someone can figure out how to get people, like, it, it, we got to wean ourselves from the rules, right? Mm. Like, what's only role-playing back is that only people who are, as we just talked about, are able, who have an imagination, who understand storytelling, who, who, who can stand being with, around other people, you know, still, even though they've been raised on computers, right? And so there's all these different limitations. But 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 it's also, they got to also be able to learn rules, <laughs> massive books, like literally, what other field of life anymore? Like, what other game do you have to have a manual to learn it? None. True. Computer games used to have manuals. It's been... 25 years since they did 20 yep. years at least like why why do role, role playing games don't need manuals they shouldn't have manuals right but that's what we can sell right and so that's why um we got to figure out you know uh how to do it i have a lot of ideas how to do it and if i had a million dollars i'd experiment with all of them i don't have a million dollars so i i have to sort of fit into the market as it is but 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 someone's gonna have a breakthrough and everyone's gonna jump on that, and I think it's gonna transform role playing. There's gonna be a big burst of creativity, and then probably is gonna boil down to you know beautifully simple rules that still let people interact, and and that's kind of what we're trying to do. Our experiment with that is gonna be our tarot card LARP, which is basically a salon style LARP, you know. 15 to 100 people max, but you use tarot cards to create your character, and that defines what faction you're in. And because you belong to multiple factions, uh, let's say you, you you basically, which one you're most loyal to is up to you. So you're always torn in your loyalties, and you're always torn. You're always members of many different groups, and then you're sort of going through the game trying to figure out which group 
matters most to you and which doesn't, but that's a personal, that's a private thing, right? So no one yeah. else really knows. That's all inside of your head as a player. And, and, and I think that kind of thing where, like, why do you need rules? You just need sort of these cards and this guidance and, and people just kind of make it up as, as a social game. And what are human beings really good at? Social games. You know, why, why is politics so fucked up right now? Well, because <laughs> people are so good at social games. They're doing it in person and online, right? But but basically, we're we're hardwired to play games, social games, certainly. You know, any society, any culture is people playing social games with each other. So so you, I, I don't think that you fundamentally need to do a really good storytelling, role playing type game. You, you, you know, you don't really need complicated rules, and I think we're fully, I think we're trapped in this. Uh, in this mindset that we need these books of rules. And I think we're gradually moving away from that. Mjork Borg is a good example of trying to move away from that mindset. And I think we need to take another enormous step, you know? And the reason no one's doing that, by the way, is that if you don't have anything, if you don't have a book to sell and role playing right now, you have nothing to sell, right? True. Like people don't want to just have our lost learn book. That's just the world, although we have that. Right, I would love to sell that. They want rules as well, and so you're sort of trapped in the. Okay, we're gonna give them rules, you know. Oh boy, okay. Well, but do I want to sell the rules, or what? Do I want to sell sell the world? I just want to sell the world, and then I have see. them make up their own rules. That would be that would be the best, right? That's not a bad idea, though. I mean, you can always just market it as a setting to go on to a more popular rule set or a rule set that somebody likes. Yeah. I mean, I could, I could certainly think of a few. I would, I mean, I've, I've done it many times already. I, I just, I take the rules I like, and then I just kind of tack on the, uh, the lore Absolutely. of the world that I like. Yeah. Which is why Lost Lorne is like this very, very vague and very, very simplified boiled down D20, right? Cause everyone kind of knows D20. Everyone mm -hmm. has their own version of D20. That, not everyone, but most will have a version of D20 that they can tolerate. So if you give them a very vaguely D20 system, they can take that and turn it whatever they want, right? Yeah. And then that lets them focus on the world. And so that's kind of like what we decided to do this time. You know, I and like I kind of wish I'd done that with World of Darkness way back in the day. Like, you know, just said, you know what? Is it is it really me being egotistic by doing D10? Like if I had just done D20, would it have gotten even more popular more quickly? Just done a very cool version of D20. It would have been better, right? I think it would have been better. I don't know. I mean, I, I still have a copy of GURPS Vampires. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How many people can Which claim I got that? Or everyone thought I was selling out. And I'm like, I'm system agnostic. Like the, the, le the thing I am least interested in is what kind of dice you're rolling, right? Like, mm -hmm. I'll give people the rules, but what I'm really interested in is the world and yeah. the setting. And, and that's what I really think is important. You know, whether or not you're, role, you're using GURPS rules or storyteller rules, it does not matter to me. And you know, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, whatever rules you want. I'd like to point out something too. It's like, uh, just like you were talking about social games and everything. A lot of people don't get this with, with the vampire. That was something that was really innovative that, um, most people didn't pick up on, but it was all the little subtle nuances of it. I mean, it's like you got your character, but your character already has like two built in personality things going for it. You know, you got your nature and your demeanor, you know, what you show to people and how you really are inside. So that's your conflict for your character to begin with. But then you also have where your loyalties really go to. Are you loyal to your coterie? Well, what about your clan? Well, are you more loyal to your prince or are you, you know, and all these little interfactional you know hang-ups and tie-ups you know with characters and in things that can trip up pcs uh really made an intricate game that uh a lot of people i think kind of took for granted uh just how yeah. involved that could be and it's amazing to me that other designers have not figured that out it seems like yeah. such a sim simple idea to me layers like i and whenever people ask me like, how do I design a world? I go, you know, first of all, kill your darlings, you know, of course, you know, yeah. but number two, you got to do layers, layers and layers and layers. 
you need to have every character needs to be torn in some way, uh, in multiple ways, in many different ways. That, that really is what makes an interesting character. And role playing really is, of course, the art form of the character, right? Because that's what each player, that's what they control. They control a character. So there's no art form that goes digs deeper or, or is more emotionally invested than role playing into what a character is. And so a, a role playing game has to give you <clears throat> like the coolest character you can possibly imagine. More layers, more details, more depth. And of course, that is about conflict, you know, because every human being is torn. We all have secrets. We all have things that we regret. We all have a fraught history that that we probably most of us i think 99 percent of us do not want everyone in the world to know every mm. detail of our history right definitely you know, that's just a fact that's just a fact you know and we're all tell lies to each other to ourselves and each and other people we're always constantly telling lies human beings are liars you know you could say you know storytellers or previvicators i can't say the word right now prevaricators <laughs> prevaricators, prevaricators. Um, and, and it, it is a very, uh, it's just sort of, you know, capturing that, you know, the best way to do that is just add more layers and, but do it in a beautiful, elegant way, but you got to have at least five different layers, right? And, and most role-playing games have two or three max, you know, and almost none of them have seven. It's like, no, add the layers in, you know, that's the one bit of complexity you should have. Whereas do you need detailed rules on you know damage location maybe not um i think you've pretty much answered this question but i, I wanted to go ahead and get it because it's uh from one of our favorite uh people out there from disciple of logris this is a question for mark what would your ideal ip be to work on um right now i have an ip that i've been working on for years called anomaly and it's about how aliens have been watching over Earth for billions of years since the dawn of life. And they've kind of had a, they've been kept other aliens away. And they've been taking basically samples of Earth. And they have, like, under, in Venus, they have basically dome cities and dome terrariums where they have, they have, like, they've uplifted dinosaurs and they have dinosaurs. <laughs> and, and uh, at Lagrange Point One, they have a, a solar a station that we can't see it because it's in the remote in God's eye. And so it's basically our solar system is full of all the experiments they've run of, of on Mars. They have desert creatures and all that we can't see it. And with the experiments running down, and now they don't want to do. It. And I would love to work on this IP, but um, you know, uh, I have to finish Lost Learn first, and then secondly, I would need someone to invest money. <laughs> you know, there it's, you go. Like science fiction is way harder to do than fantasy. Yes, because you have to get the science right, and so it, it's just very, very hard. And, and Lost Learn, you know, the reason I decided Lost Learn is that we can do Lost Learn. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Grim's just handing out money. <laughs> Put away your monopoly money, Grim. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think I think, that, I think doing something like that, like it would, like like the whole problem with science fiction is that we basically are our science fiction becomes science fantasy. True. Like constantly, we're, we're breaking mm. like warp speed, Captain. You know, like like no. If, if warp speed was even possible, that means that if there's anywhere in this incredibly vast universe we live in. Right, if there's any sentient life a anywhere, some jackass member of that species would already come here. Right, True. it's obvious that there is no possible way that faster than light exists. It, there's, it's not otherwise we would know. It, it's the Fermi paradox, right? Where is everyone? Because someone should be here by now, right? Mm -hmm. If it was, if, if faster than light, anything was possible. Just like time, if time travel was possible. Same. Some jackass would already have come, right? You know, True. I mean, like, 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 we know there's no such thing as time travel. Otherwise, it some jackass would have already stolen a machine and come back here, no matter how careful they were, right? <laughs> like at some infinite point in time, some jackass would steal a machine and come back, and it would ruin, it would change everything, 
right? Well, sh- shit has been kind of weird since they turned the current on. So, that's why I love. I used to love like the Heinlein science fiction that was set in the solar system. Right, it's more practical and 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 more sensible, you know. And it, it just it feels like it's a science fiction that would actually make us dream again of going to the stars, you know, which is so far off, you know. But going to Mars, going to the moon, you know, that's cool shit. That, that's possible. My kid could live <laughs> on Mar- on the moon someday. Maybe not Mars, but the moon certainly. There's there's giant volcanic tunnels. All we do is cap the end of them, and we have these enormous tunnels we can live in on the moon, right? I mean, it's incredible. It's like ready-made. There's water on the moon. We can get to the. We can build a colony on the moon. It'd be a great place to retire to. Yeah, not to mention if we ever figure out how to how to refine and use helium three, we could probably you know create that fusion generator that we have always been wanting. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think we're, you know, we're, I think we're, 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 you know, we, we're not that far away from these things. Right. You know, I mean, in terms of real time, and it, of course, in our expectations, we still think the future means flying cars, but you know, we've got hey, the internet. That's I just want the sex good. robots. Okay. I, I'll be happy with the sex <laughs> robots and then the cybernetics and, and I'll be, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> Anyway, all right, we're we're over two hours. Um, you know, I want to be respectful of your time, Mark. And I know Grim has, you know, done the has done the hard work. You know, because I I promised him it's just going to be an hour, Grim. And he's like, T-shirt, I'm dying over here. It's you know how late it is in the UK, and, and Jason's been here since the beginning too. So happy but to thank you for thank, being thank here and for the invite. Oh no problem, man. Thanks for being yeah, here during spooky season. Right. I, I could not think of a guest I wanted to be here more during spooky season than than Mark Ryan Hagen, the creator of Vampire. So appreciate it. Uh, and, yeah, uh, go to uh, um, um, our website. What's our website name, Jason? <laughs> oh yeah, Pop it's, that e- up. it's either lostlorngames. Lost I think it's just lostlorngames.com, I think. Yeah, and you can sign up for our playtest. We'll be sending a new copy soon. And yep. uh, we'll be doing a Kickstarter uh, not too long. Uh, just got to get adjusted to America and get, get back to the grindstone. So, yeah. Yep. And there it is. I posted Thanks. it up on screen for you guys. Um, yeah. Great. Great show. I mean, you know, sorry you, you had to come in late, but uh, I am glad you stuck around. And wow, this was awesome. I, I want to get you on again another time and just see how things are going. Cause, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anytime. I want to keep up with you. <laughs> cool. But, uh, well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And, oh, uh, nice anytime. All, All right. right. Well, we're going to go ahead and end the stream now, guys. So y'all take care out there in YouTube land, and we'll see you on Tuesday for another Week in Geek. On behalf of the staff of the Independent California Motel, I wish you all sweet dreams.